How's it going? How is everybody? Good? Woo! Hey! Wasn't Brooke amazing? So great. She was a little itty bitty person when she first sh showed up at the White House. And now she's a young lady. Yeah, the kids that first planted, they're like going to college. I know, I know. We did a reunion for the last garden dedication. Yeah. And we had some of the kids who planted the original garden, and they were on their way to college. Man, Sam, you're old. I know, I'm getting old. <laughs> it's true. Uh, well, first off, how are you? How, how is it being free? <laughs> What's going on? I'm good, I'm good. Just hanging out. Um, everything is really great. Being former is all right. I'm good with it, <laughs> you know? Everybody's good. President's good. He's, you know, running around out there in the world yep. with his shirt unbuttoned. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's the news that's going to come out of this. Yeah, I just heard about that. <laughs> um, girls are good. You know, we settled into our new home and we've got new offices. So we've been doing a lot of housekeeping. Um, schedule still seems pretty busy. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why that is. I need to talk to my staff about that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it's good. It's good. A little, little pressure off feels, feels nice. A lot of pressure off feels great. <laughs> it's great. I'll take that. So let's reflect a little bit. You know, okay. looking, looking back. Going back. Um, you know, I find myself trying to make sense of, you know, what happened over the last, yeah. you know, 10 years, really. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously that happens bit by bit. Um, but, you know, when the kids were really young, Brock was, you know, starting to try to make some moves. You were actually the breadwinner by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, how do you look back on yourself and the family, you know, sort of going about your business, having no idea what was about to happen to you? How do you remember that time? Yeah, those are, you know, I, I was back in Chicago last week for the uh, rollout of the new Obama Presidential Center and got to stay at home uh, for a few hours. Uh, and in that kitchen where it all began, uh, because Sam was helping us out at that time, because I was doing a lot of traveling, I was holding down a full-time job, kids were little, I was campaigning as well as working, my husband wasn't around. So I was in a position that many working families, parents find themselves in, where I was trying to feed my kids healthy, not necessarily doing that successfully. And we had the good fortune, I've known Sam, I had known Sam since he was a, a, a teenager. And finding out that he was a chef and engaged in healthy cooking, he had worked with families and had turned their diets around, I kind of ran into him and I said, can you help us? Uh, so having you come into our lives at a very hectic moment and just helping us kind of clean out our, our, our way of being, you know, getting rid of the sugary snacks and taking the kids to farmer's markets, I remember as we were going through the cleaning out process and getting rid of processed foods, and of course the kids were sadly looking at the refrigerator as <laughs> night, fun thing after fun thing was chucked into the uh, garbage. Um, one of the things Malia said was that, I, can I keep the, the boxed macaroni and cheese? She's like, please, please, Sam, don't throw that out. She really tried to draw Love the it. line at the cheap mac and cheese. Try to, so Sam, you said, well, the rule is, is that we can keep real food so if you can show me how to turn this block of cheese into this powdery substance that is your box macaroni and cheese, then we can keep it. That poor little thing, because that was at the time when they were even too big to stand up at the stove without a step stool. He got her a step stool, a little apron, a little bitty knife, and a block of cheese. And she sat there for a good hour trying to macerate that cheese into powder. She put, she put it in the oven. She tried to dry she it She tried out. to dry it. <laughs> it was very sweet. It was so sad. She um. just, yeah. <laughs> then she was like, you win, and just sort of slunk out of the kitchen. Right. But the point that you made was that we can still have mac and cheese. It's just got to be real cheese, real milk, real pasta, real food. Um, but those early times, that was the beginning of the thought process of how do we begin to provide the kind of information that parents need about how to feed and keep their, their children healthy. Because I struggled with it until you came into the picture. I didn't even realize that I was having a problem with it. 
So those early days were important, um, and watching how the girls opened up to this new process. Yeah. You know, they weren't the problems. <laughs> the kids weren't the problems. It was the parents. Right. It was us changing our habits. Yeah. That was the thing yeah, we they had started, to overcome. They started driving it at a certain yeah. point. They were, like, yeah. putting their foot down, like, no, Mom. No, hey, Sam, what's with that? Right? Mm-hmm. They start leading the way, and I yeah. think we've seen that time and time again. We saw it in the garden. We see it in kids like Brooke. Yeah. You know, who have turned their, their houses around, their lifestyles around because they've gotten the bug, they've gotten the information. So those early days were precious, very mm-hmm. precious. Um, so, we, so we took that, you know, after, you know, we would dream and then kind of chuckle at ourselves, with, mm-hmm. you know, our big visions. And then, man, it's like, mm-hmm. well, this isn't going to happen, is it? Yeah. Right. And, uh, but we got in and we, the first thing we did was plant that garden. Yeah, and yeah. You know, what was your expectations of that? Did it, you know, when going in and then what actually happened? Yeah. How do you think about the garden? Where, where, does that, where does that hold in your... Well, that was, you know, I mean, it, it seemed like a simple concept because it... But when we really started to do it, when we found out, first of all, that the National Park Services would let us dig up the White House, right? Which and, was a thing. Well, the South Lawn, which was a thing we didn't know. It was just an idea. But when all the answers were yes, the soil was good, of good quality, you know, everyone was excited about it. Then I remember when we first started digging everything out, I looked at Sam. I said, dude, this better work, <laughs> you know, because it's like, what if nothing grows, you know? <laughs> now we've launched this big thing. There, were no, there was nothing certain about that idea. Um, nothing. But it all started from that place of so, kind of seeing this thing through the eyes of kids that so many kids don't know where their food comes from because they're living in cities and they're living in communities where maybe they don't even see a vegetable. They don't even have access to a grocery store, let alone to watch the process of something they put into the ground turn into life and then something that they can consume. Um, It was a very simple but powerful concept. And to do it in the backyard of the most famous and important and iconic house in the country... Uh, seemed like a powerful beginning. Um, And we always had the vision that this would be something that would engage kids, that they would help us plant, that they would come and harvest, that they would eat the food, that they they would get access to the people's house, uh, that they would come to see the White House as just another cool place that they get to go to all the time. So the relationships that we develop with Bancroft schools and Tubman schools, two area schools that always came, they just became like, they were so confident yeah. in their access to the White House, yeah. you know? I mean, they were just like, yeah, we've been there, you know? The kids would walk up, it's like, where's Barack? It's like, he's at work. You know, True, like they just the- felt really comfortable, but that was all part of it. You know, because we wanted other kids seeing kids having fun with food and healthy food. And then when we would cook from the garden, yeah. that was the best thing. And we would be right out on the South Lawn and we'd have the chefs, everyone, are, the chefs would be in their chef's hat and the park district, national parks people yeah. would be out there. And the stuff that they planted would be washed right out there and yeah. they would cut it and would prepare some of the best pizzas and pastas and the kids would eat this food up and it was like you just did it you just got that food right there and it's really good so i mean as you can see i'm still excited (laughs) about the whole notion yeah it was powerful i remember (laughs) on the last the last harvest that i participated in we uh we made just like a kale salad Mm -hmm. and the little boy sat down and the little boy you know there's like 200 press and all eyes and you're there and there's all this sort of excitement and we sit down and the little boy leans over to me and says I've never had salad before, mm-hmm. but like scared, mm-hmm. like he's not, he's never tasted salad and it's a pretty, you know, big time to have your first salad. Uh, and like it could go badly. This could go really badly. There's been a few moments where actually, you know, I was all psyched about feeding the kids some raw vegetables and they realized, what am I doing? This could be a disaster. Like, right and in I, front of the press. Right. That's sort the, of when they yeah. scrape it off their tongue yeah. and they're gagging. Yeah. You know, kids, it yeah. could have gone horribly bad. Horribly. And then, you know, then I remember the first lady saying, like, this better not go wrong, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God, I can't sleep at night. Uh, but, um, but this little boy, you know, I said, don't worry, you just have a, just have a taste. You know, if you don't like it, you don't have to eat it. And he's like, okay, okay, I, I'll, I'll taste it. And he 
like takes one bite and screams like it's delicious <laughs> and like the tables around are like looking back but it's it was because we you give a kid a chance to participate and take agency i mean he had helped make that mm -hmm. salad um and then he was begging for seconds yeah, um yeah. And we saw that play out so many times. Yeah, really, yeah. it was fun. Really fun powerful times. time. So um, as you look back on, on Let's Move, um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, your thinking, our thinking around how we position the issue. You know, why, you know, why focus on kids um, as opposed to the bigger thing? I mean, I think we really wanted to position this in a way that was hard to yeah. go against. Yeah, well, you know, first of all, the numbers were real. I mean, this wasn't, you know, fake news, you yeah. know. <laughs> Obesity rates are rising um, and continue to rise among our youngest. Um, we're seeing uh, kids have higher rates of, of stroke, heart disease, diabetes. I mean, these are real numbers. Yeah. Asthma, all things preventable illnesses. You know, we're, we're living in a time when uh, our kids may have a shorter lifespan than us. The first time in sort of the history of mankind that we're in this position, and there's, there are reasons for it. Um, and reasons, if you think about it, it's not complicated. It's nobody's fault. Yeah. Um, but diets have changed. Habits have changed. People's lives are, are busier. You know, parents are working. People don't cook as much. You know, they're using more processed foods, yeah. foods in bags, and foods that are quick, and things you can microwave. And people are going out more, and it's more fast food, so they don't know what's in the food. And there are these kids' meals that are so attractive, but, yeah. you know, the calories just add up. And, you know, everything is convenient, but nobody is thinking about, well, what does that convenience cost yeah. in terms of calories and sugar intake and on and on and on. And then on the activity side, you know, schools are eliminating gym and recess. Kids are more sedentary. Yeah. The iPads, the iPhones, the i whatever, the TV, more channels, more, right. more time in front of screens, unsafe neighborhoods, so you don't even want your kids to be outside. Um, lack of access to produce in rural and urban poor communities. I could go on and on and on. It's yeah. no one's fault, but it, it's true, it's real. Yeah. So you start with that truth that <laughs> yeah. our kids are actually being affected by some of the choices that we're making. Yeah. And the thing is that parents didn't even realize that their choices were having this kind of impact. Shoot, yeah. if I didn't know, I'm a Harvard-trained, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> I'm supposed to know better. Yeah. I didn't know. So the whole point was, well, shoot, if I don't know, then what are other parents doing? Right. Because the information isn't there. Right. You can't read labels. You don't understand what you're getting. You know, you don't know what the calorie count is on that nice kids meal that you just got. You just don't know. Yep. So we start with the premise that, first of all, everyone cares about kids. You know, now let's just stop there, right? It's our kids, right? This isn't political. Everybody's got them. <laughs> Republicans, Democrats, independents, every religion has kids, we all have kids, every race, we all have kids. And kids are innocent. They come here innocent. They come here only doing what we tell them to do. They follow us. So let's start there, yep. because maybe what people can't do for themselves, they can do for their kids. You know, I knew so many moms who were eating the wrong things for themselves, not working out. But if they knew their kids were being impacted, they would change everything with a bad doctor's visit, with a, with a cautionary, you know, you're moving into diabetes territory for your child. That wakes parents up in ways that they won't do it for themselves. Yeah. You know, so starting with kids seemed like the only place to start. And then making it fun and not placing blame and trying not to be nanny state, right? Trying not to tell people you're doing it wrong and this is how you do it. It's really like, let's just try to make this fun. You now let's plant a garden. You know, let's show kids what a vegetable is. Let's try to make it taste good. You know, let's try to work with businesses and help them help families. You know, sell your products. 
you know, make your money, but just do it in a way that doesn't kill our kids. You know, how about that? And we can work together on that, you know? I'll still buy your stuff, but help me understand that what I buy is going to help my kids grow up healthy. So work with us, you know? So that's really yeah. the, the, the philosophy of, of let's move. And then let's move, <laughs> you know? Let's dance a little bit. Movement doesn't have to be some horrific exercise where you're sweating and, you know, looking all pain. For kids, it is movement. It's play, you know? And if we think about how much play has been cut out of the lives of our kids, not because the parents want it, but because of budget cuts and decisions that have to be made, well, let's get our kids moving again. Let's get them doing the things that they were born to do, running, jumping, playing a game, walking a dog, yeah. you know? This isn't complicated. It's not hard. Right. Because children's metabolisms are such that all it takes is better balanced meals, a few more home-cooked meals, a little more movement, and they're good. We're the ones. You get me at 53, shoot, I can't lose a pound, <laughs> you know? We do have it hard. Kids, it doesn't take that much to get them to a better state of health. Yeah. Um, so keeping it simple, fun, not too complicated, not placing blame, and building partnerships rather than pointing fingers yeah. was really all at the, yeah. the, the core of Let's Move. Yeah, you really always made us focus on you have to meet people where they are, go to where they are, not just keep asking everybody to come to us mm -hmm. and speak in a language that people understand. Right, that's why with Drink Up, we didn't say stop drinking sodas. Yes. We said drink more water. Right. Because the thought was that if you're filling up on water, you just won't have room for the other stuff. Yeah. So, you know... Uh, you know. Well, that's what the evidence <laughs> says. And, and, right. and that's a really an important... By the way. By the way. Uh, that's what the research said, and you know... Um, and uh, it is a message crafted to bring positivity, which is what sells. If you look at how people market products, they don't say, like, don't drink their product, drink my product. They say, drink this product and be happy, mm -hmm. open happiness, mm -hmm. be full of love. And that emotional connection is how people make decisions. And so trying, you know, part of the thing is really trying to bring that kind of insight into how we talk about health and we do it in a way that we know is going to work. Um, and I think the other thing you always stressed to us was um, we have to make this easier for people. Mm -hmm. Right now, we keep telling everybody, you've got to live healthier. It's, your, things aren't going right. All these you know, dire statistics. And yet then we leave folks to just well, that's on why their the, own to try to figure it out. That's why the school lunch program was so important and continues to be important. Because here's the thing, we already know there are millions of kids who get most of their calories at school. They're getting breakfast and lunch. So maybe you're good because you've got a chef at home and you're cooking and you're sending these healthy brown bag lunches. So again, maybe you're good, but then what about the millions of kids who are relying every day for every calorie, every healthy calorie for that school lunch? Let's think about them for just a minute. So even if, if you're one of those kids and you're one of those parents and because of your circumstance, you rely on those, those meals, even if you're trying to do the right thing at home, if you send them to school and everything you're doing is being undermined at breakfast and lunch, it makes it harder. So as you say, well, let's make it easier for parents who are trying to do the right things. And, and how about we not let kids completely guide everything? You know, how, how about we start there? How, how about we stop asking kids how they feel about their food? Because kids, hey, my kids included, if they could eat pizza and french fries every day with ice cream on top and a soda, they, be, they would think they were happy <laughs> until they got sick, right? So... That, to me, is one of the most ridiculous things that we talk about in this movement is, like, the kids aren't happy. Well, you know what? Kids don't like math either, <laughs> you know? So what are we going to do? Stop teaching math? You know, we're going to cut history out because there are kids who are bored with history? Look, we are the adults in the room, you know? <laughs> they look to us. So let's just stop with that, all right? I'm good if kids are mad at me, okay? My kids are mad at me at home all the time. And I'm like, I'm not your friend. <laughs> I'm your mother. <laughs> so you don't have to like me, but I'm helping you be a better, healthier person. 
So let's, let's, let's lead like adults. Um, so the, the school lunch program is critical to help make things easier for families, not to undermine the work that they're doing. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I went off there for a second. I'm sorry. That, that's sorry. why we're here. I digressed. <laughs> you can do that as much as you want. Uh, so school lunch is obviously a big you know, part of uh, the legacy of, of, of your work at the White House. What, what are some of the other things that stand out to you? What are you most proud of of your time? Uh, let me actually, uh, of your time with Let's Move. And if you want to expand that to your time as First Lady, you hmm. know, feel free. Mm -hmm. um, well, well, with Let's Move, I, you know, what I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the PHA, first of all. I mean, this group, the work, I had a conversation with uh, Jim Gavin just briefly, just checking in on things, and the PHA was probably the smartest thing that we've done um, out of the White House. You know, helping to build an outside nonprofit organization that depoliticizes this work and can work hand in hand with the private sector and the public sector and build partnerships in a part positive way. And the fact that this summit is the biggest and most successful, I mean, it does make me proud. Because this is, having the PHA means that this work moves beyond politics. You know, yes, I'm involved and I will continue to be involved, not because I was the first lady, but because I care about this issue and it's not going away. But the reason why we'll be able to continue to make progress is because of the people in this room and the people who have continued to push and to march and to continue to make commitments to corporations that are doing this outside of sometimes even their own business interests, but they're learning that it is within their business interests. Leading in that way, this is smart. This is how change happens, again, because you can't always count on the government, right? We'd like to, but you can't always. That's why we've always talked about it. Government can't solve this alone. You know, corporations have to come to the table, nonprofits, parents, schools, educators. This is all our fight. And the PHA is leading in such an amazing way. So this is another thing that I think I'm, I'm pr probably very proud of um, uh, when it comes to Let's Move. Um, I'm also proud of the fact that there has been a culture shift. You know, and I'm, shoot, I live in a bubble. I have lived in a bubble for eight years. I count on you to tell me what's going on out there, really. And I'm trying to get back out there. But from what I can tell, things have changed in the last eight years. You know, the products in our stores, even how things are placed. You can, I can tell in the commercials and how people market food differently. Um, that's why the companies are responding, because consumers, you all, the parents, have started changing your behaviors. And one of the things we said at the outset is that if, if you change, the market will follow you, you know? And that has happened in many ways. Not, you know, perfectly, not seamlessly, but I'm proud of the fact that people are reading more labels and they're more thoughtful about this. And this is something top of mind that they're not taking for granted how they feed their families, you know, and people are thinking about movement. That's huge. That's where change really happens. And that, you know, I can't take credit for that. I think Let's Move has been a, a, a potential catalyst, but a lot of that are regular folks you know, folks in this room and folks outside who are hearing these messages and they're making the necessary changes. And I think that that's amazing. I'm going to just have to say that you've been the single biggest force on public health that people who've been working on this for a long time have ever had. And it's your leadership has led to transformative impact. So I respectfully disagree. Yeah. I will also say that from the very beginning, you made it clear to us as we thought about, you know, how to actually try to make the country healthier, that this was never about you, that it was always designed to transcend you, transcend the White House, and really take on a life of its own. And we structured it like that. And it's been pretty powerful to see 
people just taking up the call and all kinds. I mean, everywhere you go, there's somebody who started some class somewhere. They're doing some product in a, in a church. They're going to walking clubs. It's been pretty remarkable. It's just everywhere. And it, not just here in the United States, but internationally. Um, when I was first lady, anytime I would meet a, a spouse of the leader of another country, this would be the first thing that they, they would want to talk about. Um, and they would you know, compare what they were doing, what the schools were doing in their countries versus what we were doing here. Um, so this is something that I think the United States can say we've been leading on for quite some time, and I think we should continue to be a leader in, in this area. I think that we'll look back on this in generations to come, and we'll be grateful that we stopped this trend, that we started now, um, so that the kids born today are thinking about these issues completely differently. Um, and you can change things in a generation. I mean, we got in, got in this mess in a generation, because if you think about it, I've always talked about it. We didn't grow up this way. You know, I know I didn't, and we were poor folks, right? But you always had a vegetable. I had a grandmother that would serve peas with hamburgers, which was like, no, Grandma. <laughs> it's hamburgers and french fries, not hamburgers and peas. But she would have peas and a salad, you know? I mean, my, my mother grew up with Victory Gardens. That's where they got their fresh produce. My father talked about the vegetable truck that would drive around the neighborhood. I mean, vegetables were some of the cheapest, easiest foods to prepare, greens and beans. You know, we were eating healthy, and people were moving, and you didn't go out to dinner. I mean, my grandmother thought it was crazy to eat out, right? Um, so we grew up differently. Um, so this wasn't how it... You know, this isn't inevitable. It's been created because the culture has changed, and it's hard to sort of realize that when you're in the midst of it. That's why it's no one's fault. We're just sort of the, the victims of sort of the way things are. But that means we can also change it, that it doesn't have to be this way forever, that we can, you know, we can implement new habits and new routines in our households. We can go back to the way things were, um, with the added benefits of the technologies of, of today. Um, so I, I, you know, we have a lot more work to do, for sure. Um, but we got to make sure we don't let anybody take us back. Because the question is, where are we going back to? You know, what is it that people, you know, this is where you, you really have to look at motives. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have to stop and think. Why don't you want our kids to have good food at school? What is wrong with you? <laughs> and why is that a partisan issue? Why would that be political? What is going on? You know, now that's up to moms. I'm going to talk to moms. Think about this. I don't care what state you live in. Take me out of the equation. Like me, don't like me. But think about why someone is okay with your kids eating crap. Why, do you, why would you celebrate that? Why would you sit idly and be okay with that? Because here's the secret. If somebody is doing that, they don't care about your kid. And we need to demand everyone to care deeply about our kids. That's all we have. <laughs> so we should, be, we should be driving this. And every elected official on this planet should understand, don't play with our children. Don't do it. So, you know, we've already seen them try to ensure that there's tons of salt, there's less whole grains, okay? The, the core of our work is intact, but it just doesn't make any sense. Delay on menu labeling, so we don't have basic information to make choices in restaurants. You shouldn't know what you're eating. Um, uh, but, you know, think about that. Stop there, think about that. You shouldn't know what you're eating. You're okay with that? You, do you know people who are okay with that? I mean, I just find myself just thinking now, this, is where, this isn't my fight. <laughs> you know, this is where you got to look yourselves in the eye. We have to look our neighbors in the eye and kind of go, what is going on? Because this just isn't that complicated, you know? Just tell me what's in my food. <laughs> 
why is that a problem? So you have to ask yourself, what's going on? Because I don't get it. I don't understand it. And I think the question but for us is, you know, there's now talk of delaying the nutrition facts panel, which is just another simple information so families can make better keep, choices. Keep families ignorant. Yeah. That's, ex- that's all I'm hearing. Right. You don't need to know what's in your food. You can't handle that, mom. <laughs> yeah. Just buy this, be quiet, spend your money. You buy this, don't ask us about what's in your food. You know, how does that feel? Yeah. How does that feel? This is information that's, you, that you should know. We shouldn't change a label to make it clearer and easy for you to just break down what you're buying. So consumers out there, I don't, again, I don't care where you're from, what your party is. I, I would be highly insulted yeah. by that, that thought. You want to talk about nanny state and government intervention? Well, <laughs> yeah. you just buy the food and be quiet. Yeah. You don't need to know what's in it. That's essentially what a move like this is saying to you, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the question for us is, um, do they hear from us? You know, do leadership knows that people are listening, they're paying attention, that people are no, they, engaged? They think you don't care. Yeah. You know, because what they, they hear from are the people who don't want, you know, want their kids to eat whatever they want to eat. Well, they hear from companies, too, who don't want to tell you how much sugar's in the product, how many Well, and why is that, companies? Companies. <laughs> is this the, the companies? Why don't you want to tell people what they're eating? They're probably going to still buy it. <laughs> you know? Just help us out. That's all you want. Help us, companies. Help us be good parents. Help us do the right thing. Just help us. That's all. And we've seen some incredible leadership by some. And it's time for those companies, I think, to step up and do what they know is right. Make sure we're continuing to make progress and make sure that people know who's, who's fighting against this. And I think it's going to be up to us to make sh- both vote politically and to vote with our wallets if we're actually going to be able to make make the progress, preserve the progress that has been made. Yeah, I want to support companies who want to help me as a mother. That's who I want to, I want to put my dollars behind. You know, I don't want to tell you what to make. I just want you to help me understand how you do it, what you're doing. What is this doing to my kid? What is this doing to me? What is it doing to my family? Is it helping? Is it making it harder for us? Just, just let us know. Um, but that's where we have the power. We still, you, you buy what you buy and they will, they will follow your dollars. So the question is where are you spending your money and are you paying attention? That's the other thing, you know, because a lot of this stuff happens because people just aren't paying it fact labels. Who cares about that? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know, um, but this is where stuff happens when people don't pay attention. You know, because they think it doesn't matter. They don't want to get involved. It's too complicated. And before you know it, childhood obesity rates are through the roof. That's how we got here. You know, so we can't keep wondering why. We got here because we weren't paying attention. And that's, again, it's not blame game. It's just the reality. You take your eye off the ball on things, and you let other people determine what you're eating, what you're feeding, how you're moving. And before you know it... Your kids have type 2 diabetes, and, and you're confused and shocked and hurt. And, and I hope you have health care. <laughs> right. That's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Clap for that one. Just to, just to follow up a little bit on, on that sent- sentiment, you know, Everybody cares about food, as you say. Everybody's engaged in some way about this. They care about their kids. You know, people are passionate about what they eat one way or the other. Maybe they passionately like their cheeseburgers or they passionately want to be healthy, whatever it may be. Um, and, like, for school nutrition, like, 90, over 90% of parents support good standards in school food. Now, my question is, but, but people aren't voting on that. People don't seem to be then politically engaged. And do you think that's a failing of people, you know, advocates and people working on it? What needs to change there? And do you think that's an important place to focus? You know, I, I think this is my theory. People are used to, in this society, being marketed to. 
you know um we we take in a lot of stuff right but it's got to be a good commercial it's got to have good music it's got to make me laugh it's got to you know I mean, you've got people voting on candidates for an election based on whether they like the people or not, whether they, you know. <laughs> I mean, the, these things aren't popularity contests, but this is how people take in, do I know the person? Are they famous? I mean, we just use different determiners to make our decisions, and they're not necessarily connected. Uh, so we have to be better at messaging to people in ways that they hear it. Because to think that someone is gonna read some legislation that was published in some CR and some, you know, you guys talk about this stuff, I'm like, what? I don't understand. Um, and if I don't understand it, the average person doesn't understand it. So that's why marketing and conversation and messages are important. Because people aren't hearing this stuff now. Um, so our side, we have to get smarter with how we disseminate information, how we keep people informed, um, because people are busy, you know. Parents are consumed with life. So it's hard to then, out of all the things you have to think about, then follow the fact label legislation, legislative process. That's not gonna happen, <laughs> you know, in all, in all you know, truth, it's, it's too much. Um, so then we have to get clever about how we get this information to people so that they, in real time, can make good decisions. You know, how do you connect these issues to politics? What, what, does, what does the fact label have to do with the next election? I, I don't think the average person knows that. And, and I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's unrealistic to expect them to make those connections without some real strategy. Right. Uh, to make that happen, right. and and who needs to be doing that? Well, it's you know it's the it's the politicians. They we need to do a better job. It's the it's nonprofit organizations that are really thinking about their message. You know, it's people with money, you know, who have to put money behind messages that are good, um, as well as putting money behind messages that are just profitable. Um, because it does take money to get yeah. the message out. Yeah. You know, that's why you hear about soda more than carrots. They just have more marketing dollars, you know. Bottom line is that they can, they can have commercials on TV all the time. When's the last time you've seen a good catchy carrot commercial with a nice jingle and a movie star, uh, you know? They can't afford it, the carrot people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor carrot people. Well, we work, we're working on that. We're FFB. working on we're, we're that. We're, we're changing on that. that. But money matters yeah. in messaging. Um, and there are folks out there with dollars, you know. So how do we think creatively about this and then put the resources behind it to make it happen? Yeah. All right, two more questions. Um, two more. Two more. Um, you know, I think... One. We, one? Did I just get... Oh, I said this is one. Oh, this is one. I'm just First. messing with Sam. First. I love to mess with Sam. It's an age-old tradition, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Yes. <laughs> I, I just paused and I heard Mel laugh there because there's like a, a whole thing. Um, okay. So uh, going into the White House and, and taking on these issues, I mean, I think we knew that we were taking on a very complex set of, 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 of issues here with a lot of entrenched interests, you know, sensitivities. People really don't like government messing with food. Lots of dynamics, right? And so we knew we were going to get some pushback, but we also got a lot of pushback from advocates like, were you surprised about kind of how that would play out? I mean, I th you know, hope you'd think that because we're fighting for the health of little people, uh, that you you know, we just get rally support. Did that surprise you, or how did you how did you see? Yeah, that? I think initially it does surprise you, but <clears throat> you know, we we are sometimes you know, what is it the the uh, you know, we we think we can have everything. You know, in a in a complicated society with complicated issues, with all of this diversity and different perspectives and people with different upbringings and religious backgrounds. And, you know, that's what makes America great. But that's what also makes everything harder, you know, because we just, you know, look, if we were all alike, we'd agree all the time. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I'm surprised that advocates don't understand that a, a, a win isn't winning everything. 
not in, in this political climate. So you have to celebrate every victory, even if it isn't the whole thing. You know, we wind up hurting ourselves because we're so critical because we didn't get everything. Sometimes 30% is a victory. And if we don't celebrate that 30%, well, then we've got nobody celebrating the victory, right? Because the opponents are like, it's all bad. And our folks are like, well, it wasn't everything. It just isn't a smart strategy, you know? I mean, you know, I don't take it personally, but I just sort of wonder, well, what's the thinking behind criticizing improvements? I know you want to keep the, the, the pedal to the metal. You do. You want to keep pushing. You never want to settle, right? But you, we all have to learn how to celebrate these incremental victories. In this nation, you, you change, it, the political system is structured so that change doesn't happen in sweeping, you know, uh, movements or, it, it doesn't work that way. There are too many checks and balances and they're there for a reason. So we shouldn't be surprised when we don't get everything. Um, so I think, you know, when I talk myself through it, well, yeah, maybe people, you know, aren't, they don't know enough of the gray to know how gray things are. Nothing is black and white, you know, um, and it's hard to understand when you, if you're on one side and you believe in it so, you know, it's hard to want to compromise. But yeah, as we teach our kids, life is a series of compromises, you know, um, and that doesn't mean you lose, it just means you gotta keep working a little bit harder. And I think we have to be, uh, we, we have to be supportive of one another in our victories and defeats. Um, we, I think we can do a better job at that, but. I agree. Uh, <laughs> I paid him. <laughs> uh, You'll get your check after this. <laughs> young man but uh but, but just to build on that really briefly because i think it's couldn't be more important the one thing we have that is priceless right now is so much momentum mm -hmm. and once you have momentum everything is possible and honestly watching uh your husband in his trajectory have no momentum and then gain momentum and see what happened from there really taught me that um and every time we got a win we experienced lots of big wins that were turned into losses and you know, never stopped our momentum, but definitely slowed it at times. And I think as a community, we have to really understand that our job is to cherish that momentum, feed it, and try to grow it. Even if, you know, you, you get half now, you're gonna get the next half later, if you keep, if we keep our momentum. Um, and that's something that we just, you know, on, and that was for our issues, but that was for, for all kinds of issues, issues, right? Um, okay, so um, it feels like you've been gone for a long time. <laughs> No, it doesn't. Turns out, though, it's only been like a hundred and a few days. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, I know you're probably still figuring some things out. Everybody wants to know, like, what's the plan? What's the plan? But uh, how are you thinking about the future? Because, you know, on this issue, mm -hmm. particularly, we, we're seeing a lot of progress. Rates have started to come down for the first time. So how are you thinking about yeah. your future on this? Well, that's what we're going to spend this next year doing. I mean, you know, we, we're not gone. We're just breathing. <laughs> we're just breathing, y'all, okay? Let us breathe. Um, so, as I said at the outset, you know, we've got to get our new lives set up, you know, and that, that takes some, some effort, you know, getting offices set up and um, establishing a new household, making sure our kids are good. I got one kid going to college and another one just being 16. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, so there's still parenting and life and, and all that good stuff. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we have the Presidential Center um, and there are big hopes and dreams for that. We're very excited about the potential uh, that the center can have, not just on the south side of Chicago, but in the country and in the world. Um, and it will be a platform for the issues that Barack and I care most about, including nutrition, health, and all that good stuff. Um, but I approach, I'm approaching the next chapter the way I approached this last chapter. Um, I wanna be strategic. I wanna take time to get to understand what this new platform 
is, you know, I mean, I am a former first lady. Well, what does that mean? And, you know, where are the needs? Where are the gaps? How do I make sure that I'm not redundant, that I don't supplant work that's there? You know, that, that takes some time to figure out. Um, we didn't launch Let's Move 100 days in, you know. We took the time to understand, to learn, to meet the community of advocates, hopefully to build credibility, to learn something, so that we didn't get out there looking stupid, quite frankly. Um, and that takes time, and we're going to be doing the same thing as we exit. Um, but I want the folks here to know that my commitment to these issues are real. This didn't have anything to do with me being First Lady. I picked this issue because I, I, there was deep passion for it um, because of my, you know, my position as a mother, uh, not as a First Lady. I mean, when you hear me getting riled up in this chair, it's not politics, it's parenting that is really moving me. Um, because let me tell you something, our kids are so amazing. And that has been the biggest gift that I had as First Lady. I got to spend time traveling the country, traveling the world, and meeting kids like Brooke, uh, the kids who planted with me, kids who we've mentored, um, kids from all backgrounds. And they come to this stuff so pure. And we owe them. We owe them so much. We owe them our best. Um, we owe them putting aside our politics. We owe it to them to not be cynical. We owe it to them not to give up. You know, we owe it to them to be honest, to be true, um, to be empathetic, to be compassionate. You know, in everything I do, I think about the kids that are watching me and my commitments and did I do what I said I was gonna do? Um, because that matters to kids. That shapes them and it can hurt them, you know, when you disappoint them. Um, so uh, I operate from that place because I love your kids as much as I love mine. I can't help them in the same way. I can't have the direct impact. I just wish we all operated from that place. You know, if everyone on Capitol Hill, down to every state house, to every kitchen, to every company, just operated from that place of what is best for our kids, you know, what would I want for my grandchild, what would I want for my, my daughter, my son, my neighbor, if we operated from that place, these issues would be so clear. It, 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 would, it would be easier for us. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna continue to work on this issue. There's nothing more important than our kids' health. I mean, we can give them all the money in the world, we can give them a great education, you know, and we're not doing that as well as we should. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we can expose them, but if we really want to make this country great, <laughs> then our kids need to be healthy. And they need to have access to the best, and not just some of them, but all of them. You know, all of them need to have the best that we can give them. So I think the PHA, the work that you all are doing here, is just beginning to take off. And, you know, we're going to spend the next year figuring out what does that look like? What are the next steps? And how can I be of help? How can I be a good partner? Um, and that'll take a little bit of time, but I'm here. You know, being here at this conference, this summit was important, you know, because I want you to know that, it, again, it doesn't matter what house I live in, whether it's girls' education, whether it's healthy eating, whether it's, you know, <laughs> our military families. I, I meant, <laughs> I mean what I say. <laughs> And I say what I mean, um, uh, that you've got me as a partner as long as I can be of use. And so the question for you is wh where you want me, where you want me to stand, what you want me to do. Uh, just, just let me know, um, and, and I'll be here. Well, thank you so much for all your leadership. Thank you, Sam. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Congratulations on a wonderful year. 